Are you, are you coming to the tree? They strung up a man, they say he murdered three. Strange things did happen then, oh stranger would it be? Had we met at midnight in the hanging tree? What's up everyone? Welcome to a JB and Millie conversation about the latest Suzanne Collins Hunger Games release the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes. Now, this will be spoiler heavy. We're gonna release a more spoiler-free one soon, um, but this is a full in-depth conversation where we will analyze the first impressions of the book and part one, two, and three, and also any theories and conclusions. And at the end, we'll be giving it a star rating. Please make sure to stay till the end because we will be showing, like showcasing the um, Waterstones exclusive edition and all of that goodness. So, to start off with first impressions, um, now I know that there was a lot of disappointment with people on the internet when they found out that this was essentially going to be a President Snow prequel. I know that a lot of people on the internet were hoping for a Hamish look or maybe, you know, any of the other characters like Finnick that are popular. Um, but Millie, what did you think of this initially? I I was kind of a bit out there with not wanting a Hamage prequel. I mean, I think the people predominantly that wanted the Hamage prequel were the people that hadn't read the books and just saw the movies. I mean, Hamage was a really lovable character in the movies, don't get me wrong, but for those that had read the books, they already kind of knew about how his Hunger Games went. They knew how he won the games. And then from there, you could kind of see the aftermath of how he'd got to who he was. So for me personally, there wouldn't have been much to explore with that. President Snow had never been a character that stood out to me though. I don't think he's what he's who I'd have chosen personally. But that being said, I was just happy to have another Hunger Games book because for me personally, the ending of Mockingjay was really rushed. It was a bit haphazard. It just kind of skipped ahead like, oh wow, so, you know, they're married and they've got a couple of kids. It didn't tell you how that happened, how they, you know, recovered from the games, obviously not in full, but... You know, there was just nothing really of substance to that ending. So I was just really happy that for me, that wasn't where Hunger Games had ended because I was such a big fan. I just didn't want to see it end like that. I was glad they were doing something else. Yeah, I, I completely agree with that, really. Especially because, like you say, there was quite a lot of Hamish's backstory in Mockingjay in the book. Now, it would be nice to get, I guess, more details on that. But I think that very much was a movie-oriented thing. Whereas this, I mean, you can see from the size of it, if you know anything about that, it's definitely not just something that's been put out as a cash grab or, you know, something that's been forced upon the writer to do. You can tell that it was definitely a passion project, maybe something that she's had in the works for quite a while, but it definitely does show. So in regards to the first impressions where people were like, you know, the literally the last character we wanted... I think that still is true, but in a way, I think it's probably the best version of a new Hunger Games book we could have really got. I, mean, I agree with what you're saying there, JB, and I've just taken a quick look now um, while you were speaking, and it's 517 pages now. That is a really substantial story, and personally, I don't think there was that much new material that you could have taken from Hamish to do that. I think it had to be somebody who we'd overlooked. Maybe not completely overlooked, we were aware of them, but somebody who had never really thought, mm, I want to know why you are who you are. Maybe like Coin or... I guess you could do something around mm. Finnick. Although I think if they were to do a Haymitch one, they would have to do it as like... They'd just have to call it maybe like the second quarter quell or something like that. So you do follow Haymitch, but it's more like a world building. Yeah. I think it was a really good shout out from you there about President Coin, well, you know, District 13's Coin. Because they were a character who you were kind of thrown at to accept. You never really knew much about their backstory. You know, how they got up to the high ranking within District 13. Because that would be interesting. Because mm. if it's all underground, it'd be a different setting, loads of new characters, maybe people that actually kind of have to overcome. I think that would have been fantastic, personally. And to be honest, with this release, yeah. it almost, even if like people don't want it after this, it does leave it open, like, almost because Snow would be the last character people had wanted, that pretty much means that every other character now could get their own insight, and I think that's really exciting. Even though I don't think 
it would be as good because it might be very much, you know, I'm running out of ideas now, let's just do a story about a fan favourite. Mm. I think it does definitely open the door to some interesting things. I mean, I personally would like to drop my first spoiler here and say, you know, you were saying how you could get some backstory about 13. That was one of my favourite parts that we're going to come on to is that there was just a little bit more information added to that. And, you know, you really will see from this review and some of the spoilers that are leaked through it that, you know, there really is some context added to a lot of, you know, the surrounding issues, but in a really nice and subtle way. So I'm excited to talk about those with you. So um, speaking about the wider story, as we mentioned in the introduction, the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes is split up into three distinct parts, I guess, plus an epilogue. Um, so now we're going to be discussing part one called The Mentor. Do you want to give us a run over of that, Millie? Yeah, of course, because, you know, I absolutely adored this book, so I've kind of got section by section off by heart here. Um, so section one, it the introduction just instantly takes me by surprise because, you know, the light we've always seen the capital in is really grand. There's these huge buildings. People were vomiting up food because there was so much on offer. Yet to look at that in part one, you would you wouldn't associate it with what you're seeing because, you know, it's still recovering from the war. There's damages to a lot of the buildings. It really does start at the very bottom. And you hear about the Snow family struggles through the war as well, which is a bit of insight to Snow that I don't think any of us had really considered with his character. So, you know, um, they were actually really quite poor at the start of it. And... They had to hide that because the Snow name was, you know, quite renowned. And it was about his struggles to maintain their image um, and giving a persona that made them still appear like they had the wealth. But in reality, they were struggling quite a lot. So it set the, um, you know, real war-torn feeling in the capital. And then from there, part one moved on to the reaping. So obviously, you know, me and JB are going to discuss that um, in further detail but just to give you the quick overview so and then after the reaping the um, they decide to really incorporate the capital with the um, games this year so this will be the this was the first games where the tributes were assigned a mentor and they decided that that was going to be a student from the capital and so president um, as it was known then Cornelius Snow uh, much to his dismay got the girl um, tribute from District 12. So he felt that was a real like um, mockery to the Snow name that he deserved a District 1 or 2 tribute. And so it really showed that the Snow name wasn't quite what it had been, um, that it still had a long way to go before we get to the trilogy that we know as the Hunger Games. Um, so from there, he meets the girl tribute from District 12 in quite unprecedented circumstances, I think, it's fair to say, as again, we're going to go on to discuss. Um, and from there, they start planning the approach they're going to take in the arena. So I think that's kind of the overview for part one. So JB, what did you think to it? See, I like that. The, you, literally, there's so much to unpack with this novel. I feel like even as you were going through it, I thought of something else. Like you mentioned, at the start of it, he's like impoverished, which is what I think you'd kind of, I didn't expect it, but looking back at it, it wouldn't really make sense if by you know on page one he was at the power or the you know the the level of i guess gravitas that he was in the original trilogy he kind of had to start from the bottom and then work the way top just to make it seem like a cohesive plot but when you were saying you know he was like dirt poor but he still had to keep up his appearances and appear mm. like that power maybe that's all also factors in to how he'd later go on to see, I guess, the district people as lower class. You know, his mentality could be, well, if I had nothing and I still managed to act mm -hmm. like this, you know, they've got nothing. Why can't they act a bit more human? And I think by the end of it, that's very much how he could see mm -hmm. it. Um, but yeah, like you say, one thing I loved about this section is everything is so different. The capital isn't, you know, all the towers and, you know, the drums and you know, slave after slave, really. I mean, obviously, Coralinus is in a difficult position because he has lost quite a lot of money. You know, there are some people in the capital that probably are living, like, you know, Snow was living in the original series. But 
everything from the games is so different like i guess an element that you can't ignore is um the character of sejanus who moved to the um capital from district two um because his parents had racked up so much money during the war um because they were in weaponry i believe wasn't it yes i believe that they say were like the forefront of developing mm. weapons and and so he'd actually been accepted into the capital so he was going to become quite a forefront character because that was kind of unknown circumstances that you know was he district or was he capital there was a real ongoing feud there and in fact he'd been appointed um one of the mentors for one of the tributes so he really had negotiated quite a high position in the capital hadn't he yeah i think his father had a lot of influence with that I, I think there's like a discussion where i think he gets the district two boy mentor so kind of like there was a bit of rocky grounds there but i think mm. that's very much people were thinking oh well his dad you know got him the clear winner uh, that presented quite a lot of awkwardness in the lead up to the games because it actually unearthed that the person that he was a mentor for he'd actually attended school with back in district two and so there was a lot of you know um fraction but uh, there was a lot of like animosity between the tribute because you know a matter of years before they'd been seen as equals so that was quite touchy but again back to the main character here of snow his tribute was quite astonishing in her own way wouldn't you say jb yeah it's uh lucy gray bed um i think that's how you say it anyway um and i guess there was a big fear when you found out that it was again another hunger games novel discussing a district 12 girl i think it was very easy for them to kind of fall back on like the katniss stereotype but i think they do more than enough in the like this part of the novel to differentiate her so you first see it in the reaping mm -hmm. and when she gets reaped um you get to this this sequence where on her way up to the stage she like sees someone sniggering at her and like literally like throws a snake on them yeah she is quite tough from the outset and i think one thing that really distinguishes her from katniss that they do is that um katniss was also always seen as kind of like a sign of innocence you see that um, mainly in um, Catching Fire when um, the one of the tributes kisses her um, and Hamish laughs and when Joanna strips in front of her in the lift, it's almost like playing on that really innocent vibe that she really didn't, hadn't yet become a woman. Whereas I think from the outset, Lucy Gray was, you know, portrayed as aged beyond her years i think it's quite fair to say um you know there's one of the songs that kind of really insinuates that she'd become a woman in every sense of the word and so to that end they really did contrast it with katniss as opposed to you know look for some similarities you do get the vibe of singing quite prominently which you know katniss was the only tribute to ever have really been known to sing in the arena but even at the reaping, you you know, Lucy Gray takes to the stage and sings. Um, and that's how she kind of makes a name for herself right from the outset. And I did like that a lot. Now, um, it should be important to note at this point that for me personally, a lot of the background knowledge about the other Hunger Games characters and the situation, you know, the world that it brings, for me is most part from the original trilogy of movies. Um, now, I did read all three of the original books, but it's been so long that my more up-to-date knowledge has been from the film. So there might be stuff that I'm not fully up-to-date with um, in terms of this. But also, I think, and I'm not sure if this is just Snow's perspective or something, but one thing that really differentiates Lucy Gray is she's actually initially set up in the reaping as, like, kind of insane. Like, they're like, oh, yeah, you know, her sanity is coming into question. You know, she's still smiling after she did this to that girl. and But I don't know, they don't really pick that up. Like, it shows her as kind of maybe insane at the start, and then she just goes yeah. to sweet later on. And I really just remembered that, but I'm not sure if they had other intentions or if that's just his perspective at the time. But I, I thought that was interesting. I feel like, as we previously mentioned there, that um, Sejanus was one of the only 
people from a district to come to the capital and be accepted. And so, you know, from Cornelius's perspective, I guess he'd never really socialised with a district. And so to that end, he was probably worried about, you know, what to expect from them. And seeing such an act of violence, for all they just come out of a war, seems completely unnecessary. Um, so, yeah, he really did call into question her sanity. And I presume that was for his own safety because he was about to socialise with this girl. He was about to be a mentor. You know, to that end, he was wondering if he'd be safe. Um, but, neither, none of, um, but nevertheless, he still really put the effort in to be a good mentor. So what, like, unravelled from there was when the um, tributes arrived in the capital, they, um, Cornelius was the only person to actually go and meet his tribute. The other, um, the other mentors were kind of quite distant. They were still quite reserved, like they'd never met a districtor before. I guess they were quite scared of what to expect. They also saw themselves of a higher standing, so they didn't want to be seen socialising. But Cornelius being in the difficult position he was, where he had to be able to maintain his wealth, had a lot at stake with this because the winner of the Hunger Games, their mentor, could perhaps win a free ride to university. And so he had a lot to prove. So he actually turned up at the station to interact immediately with Lucy J Lucy Gray. Um, I love how they, they do they really do a lot at the, in this section to humanise Snow. I suppose it might go over a lot of people's heads if they grew up with um I guess the I, I don't know if you can really call the Hunger Games old enough to say that you grew up with them. But I think they've definitely kind of reached that status with some people. But mm. like for us especially I think there's a lot that we can get from Snow in this scene, you know. He starts off and he's not in the most stable financial position. He's struggling his way through university, wondering how he can pay this bill, that bill, whilst also interacting with people around him. And he's just trying to, I don't know, find his way. He's trying to earn some money. He's trying to get into university. And I think that, especially now in this society, that's something that, many people can relate with even if it's not university me it, it could just be you're trying to get a job or you're trying to go to this place like i don't know i think they do an awful lot to humanize him and that does go down to um his relationships including to tigress yeah that's a return of quite a popular character because um i, I feel like from what i've been telling you here and certainly how i felt reading it there wasn't there isn't too many similarities you can draw from the initial trilogy and the story that, you know, Suzanne Collins is trying to tell us here with Songbirds and Snakes. But, yes, yeah, so they've not brought many characters back thus far, but Tigris, the designer from um, Mockingjay, the third book, um, she reappears as Cornelia Snow's cousin. And... Um, she's a couple of years older than him. They live with their grandma because both of the, both sets of parents had died during the war. Um, and so it's very much left to Tigris really to kind of mother Snow. And likewise, he's really the man of the house for providing. They both have to mature quite quickly. Um, there's quite a prominent part where Tigris has to, you know, make Snow food so that his belly isn't grumbling, so the poorness isn't given away. They both have quite a lot of pressure on them to maintain um, throughout the book. But no, that's a return of one of the main characters, uh, a character from the initial trilogy that, you know, is quite prominent all the way through. And again, I think that makes her a top contender if, like, they're going to do another one. I feel that she's certainly a character that you could really explore. Because you can see from the end how... Um, how Coralinus becomes the President Snow that we're all aware of. But I don't really see how Tigress becomes the version of her that we meet in the originals. Mm. I don't really see that at all. No, me either, because well, the girl that we meet in this book is such a strong, independent woman. You know, there's no way that she can't make ends meet. There's nothing phases this girl. Um, so, for example, um, Cornelius needed a new shirt. Uh, for the initial ceremony when the reaping took place and they couldn't afford one but you know the way that she scrimped saved went around people collected favors just to make that shirt look presentable so it wouldn't be recognized as an old shirt 
like they really did have some challenges that they had to face and I feel like you know to see how she was that really meek timid character who had been brushed away by the capital and the end of Mockingjay was you know quite a contrast and it, I, I couldn't imagine still the version of Coralinus that we get at the end of this really doing that at least not to not to her but I suppose mm -hmm. that shows how far he's come but no, I do think she's one of my favourite characters in, in the book. Now, she doesn't get too much complexity besides the fact that she's struggling and she's pretty much the one holding up the family unit, especially as you'll see later on um, when some stuff starts to happen. But no, I feel like she's definitely one of the top characters in there. So from there, though, the book really progresses. You see, like, how much Cornelius has to combat, really. Um, so... From there, when he meets um, Lucy Gray at the train station, he asks if he can escort her to their quarters. Now, you remember from the main trilogy that this was, you know, the game centre. It was a huge building. P District 12 got the penthouse. It was, you know, designer furbishings. And, you know, really quite remarkable, unlike anything anybody in the district had seen before. However, in, you know, Songbirds and Snakes, where it's only the 10th Hunger Games, as opposed to the 75th that we see in the Catching Fire book, they are put in kind of a bit of a cart and tipped into the monkey house at the zoo, weren't they? That was their accommodation up until the start of the games. Yeah, that's, that was... I did not expect that at all. Like, I didn't expect that they were going to be in, like, five-star you know, um, accommodation, because as it's made abundantly clear, it isn't like the main show, as you see in the original trilogy, like hardly anyone wants to watch it, you know, not a lot of people even in the capital watch it, but it was just weird that they really do, you know, see them as subhuman, and I don't know, they say a lot that the, the, the zoo used to be used for other things, that there were loads of different capital experiments, um, which used to reside there, but now they, you've just got your primitive animals and that's exactly where the tributes are dumped. And obviously Snow finds himself right in the middle of that. He doesn't know that they were going to be there and instantly he's surrounded by all these, you know, could be hostile tributes and like there's like a camera in his face. Yeah, someone really broadcast. threatening to him as well of the tributes. So that instantly gave him a bad impression, I think, of what the districts could be. That being said, I think Lucy Gray really did stand out to him. Um, for example, like, she, you know, she didn't, as she explains to him, she wasn't typically District 12. She was actually from a kind of fair that moved around. You know, the, the Covey? Yeah, the Covey. And they had, you know, really colourful clothing. And so she really didn't fit in as District. And that's because, you know, it was established that she wasn't. But yeah, she really stood out. Um, and... As we've said, the winning of the games meant so much to Snow that he had to really strategize to bring her to the forefront. You know, you see from, you know, the recent Hunger Games that they go for the strong men as the likely candidates to win. But here he had to really try and make an impression. And so by doing that, he tried to convince her to sing. And there's an interesting point on that where... Um, the previously mentioned Sejanus actually gets to a point where he offers um, Coralinus a chance to swap, you know. Um, I think the tribute's name is Marcus, like, you know, he's like the one that everyone picks to win. And he actually gives Snow the opportunity to swap Lucy Gray with that um, tribute. But he, he eventually turns it down because if he were to win with the District 2 tribute, that would just be, I don't know, a given. It'd be easy. Whereas if he won with Lucy Gray, it would be, you know, phenomenal. Yeah, it would be, be remembered renowned. forever. Um, I'm not sure how much that is his uh, like emotions, you know, clouding his judgment or if he genuinely believes that. I think it's true no matter what. But yeah, I see what you mean. It's, it's very much like he's got the underdog, but I think he knows that he's definitely got something good oh, on yeah. his hands. And I guess one thing that was really prominent as well in part one was the games really weren't that yet established. Like JB has been saying, you know, it wasn't mandatory viewing at that point. To be quite frank, you know, people in the district didn't have much opportunity. There wasn't the television sets. You know, it really wasn't easy 
there has been a lot of work gone in from the 10th Hunger Games to the 74th, which is the first one we see in the trilogy. Um, but yeah, initially the games were just a standard arena. They use the same arena every year. And Cornelius' mission almost, along with the other mentors, was to try and make that more interesting, try and get more viewers. And the way that Cornelius decides to approach this is to suggest that they can send gifts into the tributes. And so that's another reason that he keeps encouraging Lucy Gray to sing is because he wants her to connect with the people, to be liked by the people. That way she gets sent gifts, she can survive and she can hopefully just last out the Hunger Games. He didn't really see her as a real competitor. She wasn't strong enough to ever really take part in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And so to that end, he just wanted her to survive. They also started to talk about gambling as well, how you can bet on the tributes, um, which again, you know, is still present in the later um, books where um, once, the, once each tribute's kind of presented their talent, they kind of get given odds and so the capital can bet on them. So you see quite a few elements really taken forward into the games, but without being overbearing in like the return of certain characters, they do it quite subtly really of linking the trilogy to, you know, this new book. It's really quite delicately done. Yeah, I like it. Because one pet hate that I have with prequels in particular is the fact that because it's already a successful franchise or a successful bit of property, people do what they can just to have some like over the top cringy nod. Like, oh, it's kind of a bad example, but something I always remember is, I'm not sure if you saw it, but like, I think it was in 2015, there was a movie that came out called Pan and it was meant to be um, like a Peter Pan prequel. And there was this really goofy sequence where they've supposedly imprisoned Pan, he escapes, and there's this thing where the villain goes to like the person that was meant to be like keeping him captive. Like, what, do you, do you mean you just lost him? And the guard's like, well, yes, he is a lost boy. And just stuff like that. It's just, I think it can get really goofy with like callbacks and stuff. And I appreciate that here, it didn't do that at all. Like, you don't really get any slogans that seem forced or any characters that just coincidentally mm -hmm. have a likening to someone that you see in the original yeah and i appreciated that a lot no i have to completely agree with you on that and as well it gets to the stage where it's almost refreshing when you do see something that's linked that does come more in parts two and three that we are going to go on to talk about but no it's almost like because it's so many years prior to the trilogy that it's almost fresh enough to really make each one of those pages count without being too reflective on, you know, what was previously written. Yeah, probably if it came out maybe a few years before, it would have read very much like it was that. Um, like there would probably be a few more references, but I think it seems like she had a bit more time to reflect. Almost you could enjoy this book um, if you hadn't even read the original trilogy, I feel. Yeah, I'd agree with that. So, is there anything else that is um, of note in part one, do you think? No, not really. I think just to kind of draw a line on that is that the way that it kind of finishes is they have the tributes and mentors start having meetings to kind of plan, scheme, work out what they're going to do. This will also be the first Hunger Games where they get an interview before going into the arena, and so mm. they do start to prepare for that. Um, and it kind of ends with Lucy Gray being quite confrontational with Snow and saying that she wants him to see her as a tribute and actually that she has a chance of winning because a lot happens to reach that stage like so a lot's changed this year so this time they got to go into the arena first to see what was going to happen what it was going to look like and you still kind of see some remnants of the war in that there was um in part one there's a rebel explosion while they've been shown the arena. Um, and Snow finds himself trapped under um, some debris from the explosion. And Lucy Gray lifts a plank of burning plank of wood to save his life. And so to that end, she, she does turn around and say to him, you need to start seeing me as, you know, 
as I have a chance of winning here because, you know, I've saved your life and you need to save mine now, sort of thing. That's good. And more about them dehumanising them. So straight after that, Snow, he gets on a stretcher and he goes to the hospital. Mm -hmm. And I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, don't they say that to deal with the district people, they sent, like, the top vet? Yeah, they just get them. the vet, like, from the monkey house at the zoo. Like, that's awful. It's, like, really. It is terrible. And also, in that, um, you know, in that scene, a few of the, um, a few of the tributes escape. And they are loose in the, um, capital. Um, and what else is really interesting at this stage as well is, I think a couple of them also pass away in the explosion and... So it kind of leaves the question of what will happen. Do they, do they then get more tributes to come to the capital? So you send the twenty four full into the arena, or would they accept a reduced number? Because I feel very much from the Hunger Games that we see initially with the trilogy, you know, the capital wouldn't settle for any less than twenty four tributes going into the arena. Would you, would you agree with that? I think I think definitely. I don't know how they would do it if they'd have like a second reaping or just choose people at random. But I feel that when, I guess it's a bit more big budget and loads of people are watching it at that point that they kind of need to. Whereas in the initial time, I think um, they are just doing it more for like that fear aspect. Like they're not really doing it for hope as you'd originally, is originally stated the games were created for to give the people a sense of hope. Because if no one's watching it and no one really cares, it's hardly doing that. And it's... I don't know, it is speculated heavily that or at this stage in particular, it's like Dr. Gore kind of, um, who's like a villain in this, who's kind of just enjoying herself, like... She is yeah. quite a sadistic woman. So Dr. Gore, as um, JB mentioned there, is the head game maker. She works in a lab within the capital that starts to look at mutts. So, you know, we've become familiar with the Mockingjay. That's the combination of the, you know, um, capital manufactured um, Jabberjay with the Mockingjays in District 12. So that's one that we're already aware of, but they're also working in a few on a few more in the lab. There's some snakes, I believe, that kind of are multicolored. Yeah, like and... weird rainbow venom snakes yeah. that kind of, they, they are designed to like hone in on a target and kind of not give up. Yeah, so they see some potential of you know some more mutts there but no it just kind of sets the scene so part one does really just set the scene of you know what the capital was actually like at that time of the 10th hunger games how it was still rebuilding itself from the war how the snow family name had fallen and they really had to try and act as though they still had a lot of things that they didn't have the snow's the snow's money was completely invested in district 13 um the military base and when that was destroyed at the end of the war, the Snows lost everything. And for all they tried to cover and say they had money elsewhere, you know, they really didn't. So they really had to work hard to maintain that name. And so really Cornelius had his own fight here of trying to fight to keep his family name of, you know, presenting themselves as people of substance. And the only way he felt he could do that was to win the games. Yeah, and there's, like, the prize that he's hoping to get. If he wins the games, he gets the prize and he gets to go to university, which is his, his you know, one-way ticket to that power and the money that he'd um, kind of fallen from grace from. Indeed. Okay, so I think now I am personally feel about ready to look at part two, don't you? Yeah, I think we should definitely move on. So um, part two is known as the prize. If you'd just like to give us a rundown of what happens here. Of course. So, you know, part two is the real substance of the Hunger Games. It's the part where the actual Hunger Games takes place. It starts really with um, the interviews uh, with the tributes and also Coriolanus's last meeting with Lucy Gray before she goes into the arena. Now, at this point, he kind of consider her his sweetheart, I think is the word he uses, which is real, really quite sweet. Um, and he wants to gift her something as well before she goes into the arena. So he gives her his mum's um, a compact that his mum had left to him. And he leaves it open so she can put some powder in it. Now here's his kind of first violation. This is where he first kind of becomes a rebel. 
in the reader's eye because they both understand that this means that is, she's going to use it to put some of the rat poison that can be found around the zoo in this compact and that that could be used in the games to poison a potential victor and so to that end that's his first rebellious moment also from their um you know on their last meeting they share their first kiss don't they jv yeah i was that was actually quite sweet it's difficult um you know one thing that i would like to also state is that a lot of this i was like familiar with them this version of the book through the audiobook and it's weird because this is very much a situation where it's playing like a traditional love story, except you know that there's not really a way where things can end happily ever after, where there's always mm. going to be that underlying, um, you know, problem. And it's also interesting to note that from the audiobook, it is narrated by the person that narrated the You series of books. And from some of the things that Snow comes out with in regards to how, like, possessive he gets over uh, Lucy Gray at some point. I don't think that that's a complete mistake. I think some part of that may or may not be deliberate because I was quite reminded of that because if you cut out everything you know about President Snow, this first half plays out more or less like you'd expect a typical romance, like mm. a forbidden romance to play out. I do feel like it's really easy to dissociate um Coriolanus Snow from the President Snow we see in the later Hunger Games. So as we were, I was saying to JB there, so, you know, on the last meeting they have the first kiss. Um, and that's the night of the interviews where um, Lucy Gray sings a song to the Capitol again, trying to win herself some more sponsors before she goes into the arena. Um, from there, that kind of pans out and they go their separate ways. And the next morning is the start of the Hunger Games. So the arena's all set. Um, all the mentors are sat together in the school. And, you know, you see your first image of the arena presented by Lucky Flickerman, which, of course, is a lovely shout out to Caesar Flickerman there. Really happy to see, you know, that bloodline in the book. Um, so when you get your first pan of the arena... Uh, one of the tributes that had escaped during the bombing of the arena had been caught and he was hanging still alive in the arena. That was the tribute that um, Sir Janus was mentoring and um, the one that he'd gone to school with. So to see him that way, you know, Sir Janus kind of, that's when you saw his character develop a personality really because he flung his chair at the screen and ran from the room. And no one really saw of him the rest of the day. Um, so, you know, the games, you know, commenced, obviously. Um, and similar to the approach that Katniss had taken, Lucy Gray, you know, runs straight backwards, puts as much distance between herself and the other um, tributes as possible. And, you know, the games just start to play out. But then later that night, you see Coriolanus Snow really get his first big challenge something that really you know starts to see the sculpting of his personality because Sejanus is found in the arena late at night and Coriolana Snow is selected by the head game maker to go in and get him out before trouble starts so and Coriolanus is told he's not going to be allowed out of that arena until he can bring Sejanus out with him. And so, you know, there's a real threat to his life there. Um, because Sejanus, he's kind of got his heart set that that's where he's going to go. He's lying there with his old school friend and he's convinced that's where he's going to end too. Um, and so to have the tributes in the arena kind of pacing around you like you're the prey, trying to convince your friend to leave with you, it's quite dramatic. It's under a lot of stress. Uh, but he does eventually convince Sir Janus to go. But they're hunted by some of the tributes. Both end up with some serious, serious injuries and end up in hospital. But of course have to reappear again the next day. Like nothing's happened. Ready for the games to continue. And, you know, that, like I said, that was the introduction of drones going into the arena. Of gifts arriving. It, 
you know, it really was quite a substantial gain for the introduction of a lot of things. The games panned out quite, I guess, ideally for Snow in that his Lucy Gray did take the victory. She did become the victor against the odds. Um, you know, but that you've got to consider as well that this was a game where they actually allowed limited um, tributes because only 15, maybe even 13 went into the arena alive compared to the 24 that was supposed to be. I personally feel that my understanding of the capital before would have been that they'd have had a second reaping, that have had, you know, more people brought in from the districts to enter the arena. But no, it was only 13 or 15 that went in. And Lucy Gray managed to take the championship. So I'm going to chat to JB in a second more about how that actually happened. But she took the victory, but there was a lot of obstacles in her way. The mutts that we previously mentioned, the snakes, they were released into the arena. It was the first time they'd ever had mutts in the arena. And these snakes were trained to go for you unless, as Coriolanus had discovered, they were familiar with your scent. In which instance, he dropped a handkerchief that Lucy Gray had eaten from into the Snake of Tanks so that she was the only tribute the snakes didn't go after. And so that's how she survived, really, was Coriolanus linking her with the snakes. Much to his demise, because shortly after the Hunger Games, he was actually called to the dean of the school's office where three pieces of evidence lay in front of him. Two napkins, one of which was the one he'd used to um, show Lucy Gray's scent with the snakes and the compact mirror that it had the poison in. So to that end, part two ended, much to my surprise, with Coriolanus Snow becoming a peacekeeper he had no other option he was banished from the capital he was to become a peacekeeper now i think i heard jb's reaction to that he's quite shocked too so you know we are gonna now kind of really deep like deep dive and delve into some of the plot lines there but i guess going right back to the beginning how did you feel about the kiss really Oh yeah, so there's a lot to unpack here. Like I say, it has that kind of unsettling feeling that if it was any any other character, any other story, it is, say, your average romance. I didn't expect it to happen. I expected it to be more something of, if she survived, then that's when this would occur. Because I very much had the President Snow in, in my mind, as opposed to Coralina Snow. I didn't think you'd get so emotionally attached or romantically involved with someone that is dis like you know district so so soon, but I think it makes complete sense. I think he is very much a fallen for her from you know the first second encounter, and it's almost like from his his him making clear that she isn't district is kind of like one of those. I took it as one of those things where. You might be, for example, brought up in a racist household. And if you find yourself one day going, oh, I'm actually falling in love with someone like this. It could be, oh, well, you know, they're not really, you know, well, they might be this colour, but they were born here. Or, you know, they're one of like, you know, the good ones, you know, the, 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 you know they're different from the rest of them. And that's how I kind of interpreted it. But no, I did. I did buy the love story from that aspect, but... It was shocking and I didn't expect it. I think this part is really where you call into question, is this really President Snow? Like the man who sends 24 district children every year into an arena where all but one will die. He's just kissed a girl from this district. He has broken laws and rules to make sure this girl survives like it's where you first start to really like disconnect the man that you the boy that you're reading about with the man that runs the capital in the end i feel like i personally couldn't put the two together anymore 
Do you know I what mean, I mean, Joe? A JB. It, it does make sense when you think about it in real terms. Like he is a very fleshed out character in this. Now, I know that I'm radically different than who I was three years ago. So if you add in the circumstances of what um, Coriolanus is going through and what he's gone through, if you take into account that it's 65, you know, or so years, I completely understand how a dramatic change could happen. It's just a case of, you know, has he forgotten everything that occurred in this? And obviously, I don't believe that Suzanne Collins knew this book was going to happen when the original three were being written. So obviously, when you go back to the original three, it's not going to be the President Snow in this. Like, it can't be. She can do her best to add the context around it, but it just isn't at the end of the day, which is kind of disappointing because it'd be interesting to know if, like, there was an opportunity to give, like, some behind-the-scenes chapters of the updated version of Snow, I guess. But it is definitely a long shot off from the Snow that you see in the original the original trilogy. Definitely. I can't agree with you more on that. I guess even the way that the capital focus and present themselves is different. I personally wouldn't ever have imagined capital people in the arena. Like, how did you respond to that? How did you feel when, you know, Sejanus and Coriolanus were in that arena? It was difficult, like, to even comprehend because you'd think that there'd be much more security around it but again as the peacekeepers put in charge of that point out they're more you know looking for people trying to escape and get out than people trying to get in um i don't know it was it was very strange but again it adds a lot more to the character of president snow overall knowing that he isn't just sat there in his you know grand capital looking down on the people like he's actually been in that poor situation and he's actually been fighting for his life in the arena that he condemns so many of us you know to year after year it definitely added to him a bit um but i think more the shock factor than anything really like i, I didn't expect so much of this book to happen the way it did kind of made him a victor in his own right like he'd been in that arena he'd had tributes trying to kill him trying to stab him and he survived. And that was his first kill, wasn't it, that we know of? That was the first time... Yeah, it was the first time he'd ever killed. Yeah. He had to take a wooden plank to um, against one of the tributes and, you know, I think could repetitively hit them with this wooden plank. Eventually, you know, resulting it when they saw the corpse in the morning, just quite a disfigured face and it was quite a gory death, really. Um, so that was quite, you know, a substantial moment for him because, you know, it was his first kill. And I guess one really interesting thing that you mentioned to me in the conversation before, JB, was um, Finnick always said in the Hunger Games that Snow's weapon was poison. And by giving Lucy Gray that compact so she could add the poison and that's how she made her first kill, seeing that other tribute died because of a poisoned water bottle. You know, it, you as you mentioned yourself, that was almost like his first kill with his weapon as well. Yeah, like his signature move. And he only goes to, like, try and implement that more throughout. So I think that's just interesting, how you get that bit of detail added to it, especially given, um, given how he actually shows that his anger can get in the way of things and that is what leads to him actually killing the um the tribute as you mentioned there's some really nice kind of subtle complementary little story arcs isn't there with this in the original trilogy and i think a main theme of this novel is kind of legacy what we inherit from people and so you um you mentioned that you have Lucky Flickerman, that's the main commentator of the games. Now obviously I think that's set up to be um a relative of um Caesar Flickerman. Now I was really excited when I first heard it. It was like one of the things that really made me like you know, it was a really nice callback to the original without being too heavy handed. But then when I kind of grew to um think about it a bit more, 
I think I thought of it as a bit unrealistic how, you know, that the commentators of the games are just going to be passed on through generations. But on further reflection, it does make sense. Like, within the capital, it's almost like, you know, an anthill. Everyone has their part and everyone gets the power that they have through what came before it. And so if you think that it will be revealed later on that the original concept of the Hunger Games, at least, was it was born by someone else, but it was Snow's father that brought it to the forefront, really, if you think about it. And um, the same with, you know, Lucy Gray. You see that she sings songs that pass down through the generations. You know, Snow's eventual situation was caused by his parents. And, you know, it's all about a generational thing. And so I think the flicking connection only serves to enhance that. Mm. And I think very much, you know, you were saying there about how, you know, Snow's father was initially the one that orchestrated the games. And I think it's fair to say that it was President Snow that really made them shine because I personally found that The Hunger Games was almost a sidetrack in this book. It wasn't that prominent. I didn't think the games themselves had that much action or prominence even. No, it was almost like in the in Snow's grand scheme of things, it serves in his narrative as pretty much a final exam mm -hmm. and that's all it can be to him it's yeah. all it was even though he got invested in the person the games itself was nothing more than a means to end at that particular time i guess it was like our equivalent of doing our a-level exams like <laughs> is this going to enable us to get into uni or not yeah, like this has to go right you know you can stress about it you can revise but at the end of the day, once it's over, once you're at that, even if you're not in the position you are, it's kind of, just you've done it. Mm. It's just there. It was a platform to get you from point A to point B. Yeah. But as we mentioned, you know, when I was going through the overview of part two, the one bit that shocked me the most was the conclusion to part two. After the games, Lucy Gray had been searched and the compact had been found with the poison where the blush would have been. And... That mixed with the handkerchief all led back to Snow. And so for him to have that meeting in the Dean's office that kind of ended with him saying, you know, you're going to go and you're going to join the peacekeepers in a different district. I was kind of like, what? How? Like, he's the president. He's going to be the president. He's, he's going to live in the capital. He's going to rule the capital. He's not going to go and work in the districts. Like, this can't happen. And I really liked how it kept you guessing because, you know, you know that there was only one part left to the book. How are they going to turn it round in this time that it goes from a mean, like a little peacekeeper to the president? Like, it almost seemed like too far of a stretch for the last third of the book to really transform that. And so I wasn't expecting that as part of Snow's life at all. I was completely astonished when he left the capital weren't you yeah it was such a 360 from what you'd expect like you say after knowing his context like yeah him being poor is a shock but him actually becoming like a working person like doing you know not like an everyday job like it's still better than i guess living in the districts but being that type of worker when you know where he ends up was phenomenal. I thought that's one of the best decisions that the book actually does. And I never really thought about it so much in terms of, you know, who the peacekeepers are. I don't know if it was ever revealed in the original books, but it is interesting when you think about it. Like, say, if you look at a situation like, I guess, the first Kingsman film, if everyone gets wiped out except the elite, who does the non-elite jobs? And I didn't really wonder that about the Hunger Games. But if the capital is full of elite people, if you, it's clear that the peacekeepers are above the district people, then who exactly fills the ranks of peacekeepers? And I think it's really interesting to know that it's, say, misfits from the capital, um, qualified people from the district. So I like that bit of world building a lot. And it especially so Snow well when you think of, if you knew nothing about him in the original series... He could just be some, like, you know, inherited rich kid that comes to power and just sits on his throne and just sees to, you know, ordinary people and punishing people with the games. Whereas now you see he's gone into the arena, 
he's done like an everyday job and he's struggling with poverty. He's it's kind of fighting opposite. his way through the ranks, isn't he? Yeah, like he didn't just get to where he did because, you know, his dad was maybe president. He definitely works his way up. And I think even though he's not really working his way up to like a commendable position, you could argue, I think it does a lot for making him more human. Definitely. And I think, you know, the characters that really pulled on my heartstrings when we heard that Snow was leaving the capital was um, Tigris and his grandma. Because he'd been the man of the house. He'd had to provide a lot. He was... They did depend on him quite a lot, I think. And the news that he was leaving the capital, there was no way that they'd be able to afford their Snow penthouse anymore. It almost seemed like their image could no longer be preserved. And it was almost worrying as to how they would manage because, you know, people in those times in the book, the book is kind of quite explicit in saying how far, you know, women especially had to go to make ends meet in the time after the war. And that danger for Tigris, Tigris sorry, having to go through that, I think it really left things up in the air as to what was going to happen to the snow name. Yeah, yeah. definitely, because if you think about what has had to be done before, if he's elsewhere, he might be able to send some money, but who knows where they're going to end up. And you can see that, uh, I guess it's more discussed later on, but like the delusion that the grandma goes through, you know, asking when snow will be back, almost like telling them that they should stay awake. Like, I know you really get a sense that He's not only, like, failed himself, I guess, but he's also left, like, his family unit in a dreadful position. And it puts him in a position of of weakness that you'd never really expect him to be in. So part two really does leave it up in the air of he's going to be a peacekeeper. So it leaves you with a lot of questions of what's this going to look like? Where's he going to go? And... I was very happy with how the book panned out, so I'm looking forward to going through part three. Me too. I think maybe that's what we should go to now. So, um, as you mentioned, part three is called The Peacekeeper. Would you like to give us a rundown of this, please? Of course. So, for me personally, part three was the pinnacle of the Hunger Games books. Like I mentioned at the beginning, the end of Marking J disappointed me so badly. I'd followed this character so far and it was over in 10 pages. It was a quick 10 page summary. Whereas this really builds up President Snow. So he it starts with him deciding that he wants to be put as a peacekeeper in District 12 with the hope and intention of finding Lucy Gray. So he goes to 12. He arrives there, you know, he kind of sees around the base, realises there's some training attached to it. Um, I feel like he feels quite lonely. He knows he's left, you know, a lot of responsibility um, to Tigris. And so she's going to have to deal with that. As JB mentioned previously, the grandma um, keeps thinking that he's about to come home and that they shouldn't eat and wait for him. There's, you know, kind of a lot of emotional things there with his family. And so I feel like he really struggles with that. But I feel like he has almost a break when Sejanus is also banished as a peacekeeper to District 12. So he gets a friendly face from the capital. And all of a sudden, I think feels, things seem to look up for him. Um, he's called to do his first hanging to witness that as a peacekeeper and he also gets a Saturday night off to go down to the hub and see Lucy Gray's first concert back in District 12 and that's where the romance picks up again and they're all in love and it's beautiful they he hunts her down the next day to spend the day with her again and the romance is really sweet there was mention previously of an old love that Lucy Gray had and he does turn up and cause a few problems. Um, 
he becomes quite friended quite quickly with Sejanus and Sejanus is seen to be quite sneaky with him like they're planning something and that causes a lot of concern because Sejanus has caused a lot of problems for Coriolanus like going into the arena and so to that end I think Coriolanus becomes quite concerned quite quickly um so he does keep a really close eye on Sejanus and from there you know um it becomes a bit of a pattern the life seems to settle down for Coriolanus you know he keeps going to the shows um spending his weekend with his girl and oh my favorite like snippet and tribute to the initial hunger games is when they sing the hanging tree song in this section like they sing this a few times in part three and it just oh i love the song it made my day to hear it again it was a really nice little feature it happens at one of their concerts and but the underlying issue that's been hiding in the background is that sejanus is planning to run away with some of the rebels from district 12 and Coriolanus again finds himself in the center of this while they're working on a project trying to capture the mocking jays in district 12 um and he records a message with a mock with a jabber jay that Sejanus has a plan to support the breakout of a rebel in District 12 to run away with some other rebels from District 12 and you know Coriolanus really made that decision then to support the capital as opposed to his friend and I feel like that's one of the first times where I kind of can reconnect the two like Coriolanus, President Snow, the two finally go back together in my eyes there. Um, so from there he carries on the romance with Lucy Gray and I think the issues that start to arrive is when um, Sir Janus is about to run away um, kind of a gunfight breaks out with the rebels and um, Coriolanus finds himself with no option really but to you know shoot the mayor's daughter and you know that's really his second prominent death there because he had to kill to protect Lucy Gray um, and so to that end he's got, got to again be quite cool and calculated but his fingerprints are on an illegal gun like a gun that the rebels aren't supposed to have has his fingerprints on it and he knows if that ever comes out then his career his life is over and to that end I think he realizes then he's got to get away Lucy Gray at the same time starts to, you know, suffer some real serious um, harassment from the mayor because his daughter's now died. And because it was his daughter's fault that um, Lucy Gray had to go into the arena, he holds her responsible for her, the daughter's death, saying that she must have been the one to kill her. And so they both feel that they need to run away. And so they agree to. And on the morning that they're about to run away, Coriolanus receives an offer to train as an officer in District 2, which he only wishes he could take, but he can't because he knows when that gun's found, his life's over. And so to that end, he decides to still run away with Lucy Gray. So they meet at the hanging tree, which was a secret message to him the night before when she was singing on stage. That's how I knew where to meet her when she sang the hanging tree that, you know, really becomes the face of the rebellion in Mockingjay. Um, so they meet at the Hanging Tree and they decide to go by the lake one more time. Now, if you have read the original books, this place might be quite familiar to you. There's a cottage near the lake with a roof where Katniss and Gail, I think, take shelter when they're hunting one time. So anyway, they're at the lake and it starts to rain and they take refuge in the um, sheltered house. And the door's a bit jammed, so, you know, Lucy Gray pushes it, it opens. And in that cottage, Coriolanus finds the gun with the fingerprints that he used to shoot the mayor's daughter. And from that point, he knows that if he can dispose of that gun, he can take that officership in the uh, District 2 
and he can start to rebuild his life. He's got to think about Tigris and providing for her and the grandma. And so to that end, he starts to think maybe he needs to leave. Around that time, they've got a fire started and Lucy Gray says she's going to go and collect some Katniss um, to make dinner before they start to run away further. Um, it's then that, you know, Snow makes his decision that he needs to go back to the base. And so he gets the gun, he goes outside and calls for Lucy Gray. He needs to explain to her, but without making, you know, without making her angry because she knows that he killed this girl. And so he needs to get her on side. And she's nowhere to be seen, much to his surprise. So he calls after her, you know, Lucy Gray, Lucy Gray, and she doesn't say anything. So he decides to track her. And he'd given her an orange scarf that belonged to his mum. And he saw it in the bushes. So he went to the bushes where a snake bites him. Now, one of the key things about Lucy Gray is she always knows where you'll find a snake. And she'd planted that scarf in a bush where she knew there'd be a snake. She intended to kill Coriolanus. And this was his first love. I feel like he was quite, you know, upset, angry. And so he decides then that this girl needs to pay. So he tries to hunt her down and ends up shooting through some bushes. And there's a lot of confusion. You can't tell if she's actually died, can you? you like, I don't know if you found the same, JB, but I'm quite unsure about that. Yeah, it does lead a very ambiguous. Now, when we get more to the theories section later on, I think we'll have a lot more to say about that. But I do like how it leaves it open-ended. It's not just, you know, mm -hmm. and... I think they draw parallels eventually. She sings a song about someone called Lucy Gray, who is either a ghost or a bird. It's unclear mm -hmm. what her fate is. She's like missing. She's like a wanderer. And that's what the real Lucy Gray is set up to be by the end mm -hmm. of it, which I quite like. All we hear about the mythical Miss, uh, Lucy Gray is that the footsteps end and there's nothing beyond it. So could she be a ghost? Has she flown? And again, they track Lucy Gray so far, but they never actually find her. So to that end, Snow makes his decision. He goes and throws the gun with the fingerprints in the lake and then rushes back to the base where he's going to pack and he's going to go to District 2 and become an officer. So the next day he gets in the hovercraft, heading to District 2 and falls asleep. Not much later, he arrives back in the capital. Much to his astonishment, he's told that this is in fact where they've been told to drop him off where he goes, he gets taken to the head game maker who says to him, how did you enjoy your summer vacation? She explains that she'd invested a lot of time in him and that, you know, she'd always wanted him to really excel. And so to that end, you know, the peacekeeper thing had been a little more than a side project for her to make him do. And that she was going to, um, she's going to train him at the university and he was going to have a real capital life worthy of a snow. Um, furthermore, you know, to the end of that and how the snows rose back to wealth, um, Sejanus's father, who was really devastated by the news of Sejanus's death after having been killed due to association with the rebels, um, his father decided almost to adopt Coriolanus and, 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 you know, transfer the fortune and inheritance to Coriolanus. So, you know, he took what, you know, would have been Sejanus's. And to that end, the Snows managed to reclaim wealth, status, and really, other than, you know, not getting the romance he wanted, in fact, never wanted again. He said he'd rather marry someone he hated than fall in love. It was a happy ending, really, for Coriolanus. He got the Snow family back on top. Because remember, Snow always lands on top. And they really reclaimed the life that they'd been accustomed to before the war. It kind of leaves it there. There's a little, you know, interim bit where he um, uses poison again as his weapon to kill the Dean who'd made life really difficult for him throughout the story but other than that snow really landed on top 
And I think that's really what it wanted you to take away from that. It was quite a prominent saying all the way through. And for all you never got to the part where he became, you know, president, you really saw him rise again. You saw the snow really rise from, you know, what it had been after the war. So to that end, it really did have quite a happy ending. I was really happy with it. I'm normally, I'm quite the girly girl for romance and wanting things to have a happy ending. But I was so pleased in a way that it did have that happy ending and it proved that it didn't need to be from a relationship either. I felt really positive coming out of that. So again, it's quite a lengthy part of the book. So I realise we've gone over a heck of a lot there. So I'm going to take it right back to what we were talking about at the first part of part three, which was his arrival in District 12 and seeing Lucy Gray again. Okay, so JB, how did you feel? Like seeing the relationship spark back up again, did you think it was feasible? Or? I, I had quite a few problems with this chapter. Like I think overall... It is the one with the most potential. It was so out there. I didn't see it coming. But I almost wish that we had more time with it. Like, I remember the group of peacekeepers. There's one that's what called, like, I don't know. Is it Beanstalk? Oh, Beanstalk, Beanstalk like, yeah. Um, he's, like, some goofy peacekeeper. And there's a few other, like, it's like a ragtag team that gets assembled of, you know, they're kind of like a family mentality. That's what they want to convey. But you don't really get any time to know them as people. And you don't really need to. Because I think at the core of the chapter is... It's kind of like a love triangle. But not in like a romantic sense. It's like a, a relationship triangle. Um, You've got Sejanus wanting to pursue his you know life as a rebel. To run away. Which then impacts Coralanus. Because he sees him as his responsibility. And if he goes down. He's going to be guilty by association. And I think maybe a bit of it is maybe jealousy because Sejanus is getting quite close to, I guess, Lucy Gray's old suitor that it's, it might, might cause a bit of friction. And in terms of him himself, he's struggling to find out where Lucy Gray's going to go from him from here. Should he go with her? Should he not? And I think that's that it does that quite well, I think. It doesn't really need to linger on the group of peacekeepers, even though I think that would have been phenomenal. Like, why would you go to this completely different setting and not fully utilise it? I think it could have been better, but it did all right. Now, I thought that the death of Sejanus was quite impactful, just the fact that he called out for his mum at the end. And, of course, the one part of this is that if you get hung by the hanging tree then of course your last words are echoed by the Mockingjays. I thought that, that was something that they introduced that was really kind of freaky mm. to think that whatever you come out with at that time, it's going to be echoed there. But I thought that was quite impactful and it made sense. Is this What I didn't like was, even though it built up quite well, it gave us so much story beforehand to lead up to those moments. I just thought that Coralinus went from... Went from Oh, I'm completely in love with this person to I want to kill this person very quickly. Now, they say that there's a fine line between love and hate. I just think that because it's so much from his point of view, we could have got some of that inner turmoil. We could have got some of the pain that you felt as opposed to the anger or just something that says, oh, I don't want to kill this person. Or if he came face to face with her, maybe he hesitated before pulling the trigger or something. I'd have just I'd liked to have seen some more internal conflict and... I liked how it ended. I really do how, like, you know, Snow really did fall on top. But all throughout the original series, it's Snow is cunning. He's clever. He's usually always one step ahead of you. And I like that a lot. Like, you can, you know, he leaves Katniss the rose whenever he's going to tell her that he's going to do something. He's got his eyes everywhere. Whereas this kind of does away with that. It's Snow isn't cunning. He's not clever. He does things on impulse, which turn out to be right. He doesn't plan on getting Sejanus murdered. In fact, he actually, you know, I think he cries when that does happen out of shock. And yet it comes, you know, all of it wraps up perfectly for him. And yet he didn't orchestrate it. And I think that's the biggest weakness. You know, Snow is no longer the all-seeing 
Hana, he's just a, almost like a really lucky buffoon. He does everything by accident and just lands on top, mm. you know, through luck. And I don't know, I kind of think that that, uh, that changed it quite a lot. You know, it wasn't his rise to being that powerful figure. It's just sometimes you do things and it works out. I mean, I'd quite like to counter that because... For me personally, this has been my favourite Hunger Games book. And so to that end, my kind of understanding of that is before he met Lucy Gray, Coriolanus had to plan everything to make sure that he maintained the image. It wasn't the book, it was planning. It was merely the distraction of a girl that kind of heightened feelings and impulses. And I feel like for anyone that's been in love, you can associate with that because... Sometimes when you're in love, you don't choose your reactions that happen because you love somebody. And I feel like maybe that's why he reacted as impulsively as he did. And I think before he decided that he wanted to harm Lucy Gray, she tried to kill him. And I feel like if someone that you're in love with, someone who you've, you know, he his life in the capital ended because he fought for her in the Hunger Games. He you know, gave that the handkerchief to the snakes. He gave her the compact to smuggle poison in. He risked everything. He risked the entire family name for this girl. And for her to try and kill him, I feel like any of person would, you know, ha have an impulsive reaction to that. You not know think? I think so, but it's how he dealt with it after as well. It's like... It's not, you know, sometimes I miss her or I wish, like, you know, that it happened another way. It's, you know, next time I'm just going to choose someone that I hate. Like, he, he, is very, he is very scorned by it, which he can see. But, I don't know, I just feel that in his life, that at that point, there were three struggles. One is that he was, um, I guess, banished from the capital and he was um, forced to be a, um, a peacekeeper. Another is that him and his family are now incredibly poor. And then there's the thing with, like, Lucy Gray, the turmoil. Now, the first one about him being banished, it just turns out to be, you know, prank, got you, like, it, it wasn't a banishment, we just sent you on work experience. That was out of his control. It was just, you know, Dr. Gore going, you know, there, how, how was that? Like, you know, something to our TCV. And the second one about them being impoverished. Now, if he'd planned that that would kill Sir Janus, if he planned that then, oh, well, I'm in such high standing with his parents now that there's only one person that they can leave all this to, then fine. If there was a thought towards that, then I I could buy that this was all planning. Um, and then the third with Lucy Gray, like you say, I agree that you can have different and extreme reactions when you're in love to when you get hurt so badly, but I just think that th the main things that make him rise to power happen by accident. And, I don't know, I think it was easy, it could have been so easily insinuated or put in that he had those thought processes, because logically, yeah, if he got Sejanus out of the picture, he would get the inheritance, or it's more likely than not, with how close he was to um, Sejanus' mum, like, she was so grateful to him getting um, Sejanus out of the arena. Yeah. He even called her Ma, didn't he, yeah. by the end of the book? But it just simply wasn't, the planning wasn't there. And that's the one thing that kind of got me about it. I think I'm a true romantic. So for me, just that it ended in a way that I could accept after reading that hideous ending to Mockingjay. Yeah. That was a bit shambolic. It was a complete car crash, really. To have something that symbolised this is, you know, could be the last book. It's ended cohesively. It's left potential. For me, that's why I'm so happy at the end of this book. And for all I get what you're saying, some of it did appear to be luck. I feel like the Snows had had so many struggles in the past of when he'd not been able to eat, of, you know, Tigris, Tigris had to admit to doing some quite terrible things to be able to provide. I feel like that was more than just mere luck. There was some strategy to that. And so maybe it was overdue, some luck, but... And to some end, there was strategy on his part. It wasn't that, you know, Sejanus was his friend. That took some real acting on his part. At one point, he almost despised that someone from District 2 could have the wealth, the title, the 
the tribute that he thought should have been his. So it's that and maybe perhaps some more work did go into it, but I can see completely why you feel some of it appeared to be gifted to him. Yeah, yeah, that is true. Because he does have to bite his tongue through a lot of this, especially with Sejanus. But I don't know, it becomes clear that not all of it is acting. It, are, it is his genuine feelings. Like he, he genuinely did fall in love with Lucy Gray. He genuinely did become attached to Sejanus. But I see what you mean. I think if this is the last bit of official canon Hunger Games, you know, literature that we get, I think I'm more than happy with it. I completely agree with that. I think it, it really did end on a high note because I do agree that the ending of Mockingjay, from what I remember, was just rushed, mm. not thought out, and a bit tagged on. Yeah. From what I recall, they missed a lot, and I'm quite, I reread quite a lot, so it really was just a case of the games are over, we're going to vote that there should be one with the capital children that never occurred, and you just see that Katniss and Peter have a couple of kids. It's not anything substantial. Really, really disappointing, so... I think that's why I'm so pleased with the last part of this, just because I feel like it ended in a way that I could accept. Yeah, I agree with that. If it is to end, I think it's it's done a good job. I, I don't know. I think it's been it's been amazing. It's been a great conclusion to the Hunger Games series. If it is, and if it's not, then it's not deterred me that I don't really want another book. I know that if they announced, look, we're going to have... A story about the first quarter quill and it's going to be out in 2022 then yeah i'd get mm. that and i'm looking forward to reading it brilliant i mean i'd definitely read that and i'm excited to hear that there's going to be a movie of the songbirds and snakes so i can see how other people perceive it because one thing i've enjoyed about talking to you tonight is just hearing how you take this book because i think other people's just perspectives are so important you know i can almost see how snow continued the games because to me initially reading this he fell in love with a girl who was forced into the games how could he ever support them but to see that maybe her love was nothing but an act it often refers to her as you know some quite performance like imagery that maybe the love was an act and so to that end i can understand how he ended up how he did I have a couple of questions myself as well, further to this, that I'm looking forward to taking your take on. So maybe if we end part three there and start to talk about some theories about things, I certainly have a couple of questions for you. Yeah, so um, we'll definitely move on to that. I do have a substantial theory. Okay, so um, this theory is, of course, about the Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes, the new Suzanne Collins release. Now... This is kind of a bit out there, and as I've kind of stated in the, you know, in the other sections, most of my knowledge is unfortunately from the movies. It's not um, maybe influenced as the, in the books as it should have. In hindsight, I would have loved to have reread the original trilogy before reading um, Songbirds and Snakes. And I think eventually I will do that. I will read them again in the future. But here's what I thought was going to go down. Now... We know that the relationship between um, the future president Snow and Lucy Gray isn't going to go well. We know that Snow, in no way in this book, does it make him a great person. Yes, afterwards the tributes are actually treated like human beings. They're given luxury apartments sustained before their games and they're well fed. Which is so different from the zoo that they're given in this. Um, but we know that he comes out to be a very, very sadistic man from all of it. Now, one thing that Lucy Gray loved to do all throughout the story was to sing. And the one thing that he knew that he could do to really get under her skin, to really hurt her, would be to stop her from singing. Now, this is a universe where we have Avoxes. That's a common thing that happens where, basically, um, I guess people are enslaved, their tongues are cut out so that they're not able to speak or anything like that. And they do exist at this time because it said that um, Sejanus's parents have Avoxes. They're nice to them, you know, they give them like softer food so that they can eat them, but Avoxes definitely exist at this time. It's yeah, not they're a new... the chauffeur for the yeah. um, Sejanus's family. It's not a new concept. So I was thinking maybe Lucy Gray would do something. And that would result in Snow cutting out her tongue as, look, 
um, I've become jealous because you're singing this song and it's clearly about the other guy. Or look, you've just wronged me, so I'm going to talk to you like this. And she gets her tongue cut off. Now, I'm not sure where she'd go from here, but I imagine that she'd be sent off to another district. Maybe she even tried to tag along with the covey. And they obviously are meant to be travelling around various places, even though they have been confined to District 12 for quite a while. And my theory was, is that eventually, um, Lucy Gray would become Mags, as seen in Catching Fire. Now, this would mean that she would participate in free Hunger Games overall. But my reasoning behind this was, of course, the Avox thing. But it would explain why she is so kind initially to Katniss beyond um, the Alliance and the Rebellion. She definitely takes her shine into Katniss. And you'd imagine that she would naturally gravitate to the female district from District 12, like the female uh, tribute, because she's been in that exact position herself. And she's actually a victor at that point as well. And you mentioned before when we were speaking about it earlier that how they bond is when um, Mags teaches Katniss how to make the fish hooks. Yeah, and there is a moment that I forgot to mention where um, Coriolanus has been taught by um, Lucy Gray how to make fish hooks. So that kind of linked quite nicely. And not only that, but you were pointing out to me, you did say on the topic of Avoxes, but we never hear Mags speak, do we? She does kind of like hand signals yeah, and gestures. Yeah, would explain that why she is so silent, why she is kind of like this unspoken character, but she's also quite kind-hearted. Everyone's kind of got respect for her, even Hamish, which is kind of unclear how he would know her, but if she was a past victor, you'd got you'd kind of got to understand that she would have been a mentor at some point. I don't know how she would have got a message across, but if they encountered that way, then that is likely... Mm. But yeah, um, I think, um, of course, fishing and knowing how to make fish hooks will be common in especially, you know, the the sea-based districts. But Which I think, 12 wasn't. No, so she clearly has to move about. And if she already knew it then, perhaps she had connections to other districts that she could have gone to to get that knowledge. Because how would she mm. have learned how to fish in District 12? It's mainly forest land. There is that lake and that pond, obviously. But to get that knowledge in the first place... I think there's quite a lot of evidence to suggest that um, Mag, that Lucy Gray would become Mags because obviously, like you say, at the end, it's left quite ambiguous if she's mm. alive or not. We know that her legacy lives on in the songs because they're still used for the modern rebellion, but she'd have to change her name. She'd have to find another place to live. That could have been the district that Mags is from. Yeah. The only thing is, is that for that Avox thing to work, it's you know, would Snow find her again? But it makes perfect sense because Snow, as has been acknowledged before, she's the only person who knows that he is responsible for the death of the mayor's daughter. She has a secret that nobody else can know. And so if she did live, he'd want her silence, that's certain. And it would only really work out if Snow is the one that Avoxed her or the one that ordered the Avox. Because if it just happened by chance, it wouldn't have that sadistic thing like we're going to stop the songbird from singing. It would just be, I guess, we can Avox this random person. It wouldn't really have that intent. And you kind of think that Snow would have recognised her, especially when she was like there in the quarter quell being so public. But... Because she's set up to be a romantic character, she sings a song about love, she wants, like, all this, you know, relationship. Like, that would explain why she's more kind and lenient to Finnick and Annie later on. Mm. See, I think me and JB take very different things from the story because, like you said there, she appears quite romantic. By the end of the book, I quite despised her character. I personally think that there was a kind of vindictiveness that you know, in her trying to kill Coriolanus with the snake that was really quite uncalled for. And so to that end, I kind of see her as a bit of a villain. I almost feel like I can sympathise with Coriolanus and understand why he pursued the games afterwards because, you know, an act like that of kill, of trying to kill somebody who he saw as a love, you know, 
it fed the theory that perhaps people from the districts were more animalistic, that they didn't have the same feelings that the people from the capital had. I don't suppose you could blame them, really. I don't think any part of this you meant to take away that Snow is the hero. I think he's definitely the hero of his own story. I think everyone is in a way, but... I do agree that she does kind of turn on him in a way that is almost like everything was an act. But at the same time, if she was acting to stay alive in the situation that she's in, that the world's in, apart from the capital, I think you can kind of see how one could adapt to that lifestyle. But from Snow's point of view, you can definitely see how he would be motivated to genuinely believe, you know, deep down that the games are the right thing to do. But yeah, it's just, I thought personally that the story would go that way. I strongly... I mean, there are other, other theories out there that you know, Lucy Gray lives on and becomes an ancestor of Katniss, or that the little girl in the cubby becomes an ancestor of Katniss. And they're all fine, but I don't, I've don't. i not seen this Mag's theory anywhere else, probably because it's so easily disproved in that world you don't see her get Avox by Snow in the book. But I just thought that that's where it was going to go. And I thought that would have been perfect. Mm. And it would have added so many layers into a character that we already know. And we discussed earlier that the ages would kind of line up. Yeah, you've got to consider that Max looks almost older than Snow. And if this book's based on the 10th Hunger Games and given, you know, the age requirements for been entered into the reaping, she'd have to be somewhere around between the 5th and 12th Hunger Games. And as mentioned, this book sat on the tent, so that would kind of fit with that. And let's not forget, though, that she would have had to have gone back into the arena because if she were to get put, like, you know, reaped into the pool of victors in the third quarter quell, she would have had to have made it to Victor's village, which was only established after this. So it's clear that she did find another district and was reaped again under whatever mm -hmm. pseudonym she was going with at that time. But I don't know. I think that if they had found a way to integrate that, I think that would have been amazing. I don't think it's true, but it's something that I'm kind of like reading into and I like it a lot. I really like that theory. Like, JB, you've always been better at thinking of theories than me, I must admit. My questions that I had for you require so little contemplation in comparison to all that that you've managed to consider. One thing that you did mention that I'm really interested in is you said there's a theory that, you know, one of the characters we met perhaps is an ancestor of Katniss. Now, we do, you know, notice that a few songs are carried down. There's the Hanging Tree song, and there's also the song that she sings to Rue that's present in the book, from reading it, do you think that any of the characters that we met could be an ancestor of Katniss, in your opinion? I think it would be the smaller girl from the cover. I don't Mount. remember her name. I'm, I think maybe. I don't know her name. I can't remember her name, but I think it would have to be her. I'm not sure if it's going to be her mum. I'm kind of leaning towards, you know, grandmother. I didn't really pay much attention to these theories in particular mm -hmm. because... I was thinking, you know, when this is read, everyone is going to be trying to link um, Lucy Gray and Katniss together. I was kind of trying to think more outside of things. But I definitely think it leaves it out there, especially because isn't Katniss a pet name for something? Like, she says, some people call it this, but I prefer Katniss. Yeah, the potatoes that they dig um, near the lake, they call Katniss. So I think definitely one of them could be a relative of Katniss. Especially because District 12 doesn't look that big. Mm. That is so believable. I think it's more or less probable, but I'm not sure. Great, thank you. And the other question that I guess I have for you as well, and please, if, you have, if you're listening and you have questions, please drop them in the comments. We're loving discussing the conspiracies and things hidden in this book, so please keep, you know, dropping comments on those and we'll get back to you with that. But... In terms of President Snow's granddaughter, he has a granddaughter in the movies, doesn't he? Yeah. Who do you think Coriolanus Snow ended up having a child with? Do you think we'd met the character? Because he did say at the end he could never fall in love. He wanted to marry someone he hated. Somebody who could never have control over him or his decisions ever again. He did suggest there was someone called Olivia at the end that he might consider marrying. 
do you think that we'd met anybody that was in the running to be President Snow's wife? I mean, here's the thing. Whoever he's going to marry or whoever he had a kid with is going to be of high standing. They're going to be wealthy. They're going to get good medical care. I think it's important to note that People can prolong their life in the capital beyond their years. It says Caesar Flickerman has been doing the Hunger Games for 30 odd years and he looks the same. So it is available, but the fact that we don't see um, President Snow's partner is telling of that. You know, why isn't she around? She's either got to be quite a bit older or was in ill health, which to me is unlikely given the capital's resources and the stuff they can do. So, it is interesting. I'd like to think maybe he would have just chosen... I think he's not above choosing someone purely for the purpose of... Standing? Yeah, just getting his legacy. And then once he had that, maybe he'd AVOX her or she'd just go off and say, Oh, look, I've, got, I've had the, you know, the privilege of airing the air to the, you know, to the, I guess, the capital. I don't think we'd have met them in the book because obviously he said oh, maybe this person, but that you know plans like that rarely work out. Mm. I don't think we'd met them, but I'd be interested to know who it was. Okay, great, thank you. So, do you have any other questions that you want to ask in terms of theories or anything, JB? No, I'm I'm good, thank you. I think we've had a really good in depth conversation about this, um, and I think it's probably about time to conclude. Yeah, so my last question, I guess, for you is on a five-star scale, where are you going to rate the book? So I gave it four stars on Goodreads, and I'm kind of thinking that I have to stand by that. Now, I'd like to give it five stars. I think it definitely is a five-star book, but for me personally, there's some character decisions, there's things that are kind of missed out that stop me from saying right this to me is a perfect book if you want a master class on how to write this is where you should look i think it's definitely one of the best prequels it's my favorite personal hunger game book although that opinion may change but no i think i'm going to have to go with the four stars on this one okay. what about you where's your, where's your opinion on this well, I'm going to echo a lot of what you've just said. It's my favourite Hunger Games book. I don't think a prequel's ever been done so well in history. Like, the duration between it, the independence of the character from the books before. I don't think it could have been done any better, personally. I love how the writing's taken a more mature stance. It really aims at the readers that would have been, you know, mid-teens when the Hunger Games books were initially released, I think. And so to that end, I can't, and because it gave me a fine, final ending to what I wanted from the Hunger Games series, I can't help but give it five stars and offer a round of applause to Suzanne Collins. Like, amazing read. I adored it. I read the entire thing in three days. It was absolutely perfect. No, that that's good because I think we're both kind of along the same lines. It's just... I was a bit more critical of it than you, but I think we're both kind of on the same wavelength with it, really. Indeed. Thank you so much for listening to us. We have loved this book so much, and we've loved so much theorising with you. Like I said, please drop any questions or theories that you have in the comments, because we'd love to be able to read them and kind of debate them ourselves. Don't forget to like, subscribe. We hope to do so many more videos like this, because we've both had so much fun, and Please stick around for the end of the video where we're going to take a closer look at the edition of the book that we purchased and also the version of the Hanging Tree song that was present in the book. Thanks so much for listening this long, guys. Bye. Hey, guys. So this is the copy of the book that we've been reviewing today. We got the lovely Waterstones exclusive edition. So I'm just going to show you, a, take, let you have a quick look at what that looks like. Okay, so it's got this lovely front cover here. Again, you can see Waterstones exclusive. You've got that snake on the front cover. Snakes always kind of freak me out, but you love snakes, don't you, JB? They're awesome. And then, you know, you've yes, got this yes. ribbon down the middle. It's kind of like a bookmark that you can use. Again, with that snake imagery there, which just freaks me out. But again, JB loves it. <laughs> Are you?
are you coming to the tree? They strung up a man, they say home at a three. Strange things did happen here, no stranger would it be if we met at midnight in the hanging tree. Are you, are you coming to the tree where dead men called out for his love to flee? Strange things did happen here, no stranger would it be if we met at midnight in the hanging tree. Are you, are you coming to the tree where I told you to run so we'd both be free? Strange things did happen here, no stranger would it be if we met at midnight in the hanging tree. Are you, are you coming to the tree where a necklace of rope sat beside with me? Strange things did happen here, no stranger would it be if we met at midnight in the hanging tree. Are you, are you coming to the tree where I told you to run so we'd both be free? Strange things did happen here, no stranger would it be How we met at midnight in the hanging tree Are you, are you coming to the tree Where they strung up a man they say who murdered three Strange things did happen here, no stranger would it be If we met at midnight in the hanging tree are you, are you coming to the tree where dead men called out for his love to flee? Strange things did happen here, no stranger would it be if we met at midnight in the hanging tree.